الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتلي لولا أن حلان القدم أن حلان الله والصلاة والسلام وخير خلقه ونور أرشه وأفسر الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا سيدنا ونبينا وسندنا وشفينا ومولانا أبو القاسم مصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين قال الله تعالى في الكتاب الكريم بقول الحق وفي الأرض آيات للموقنين وفي أنفسكم أفلا تبصرون صدق الله العلي العظيم and in the earth there are signs for those who are sure and in your own souls too will you not then see the two ayahs of Surah Dariyat that I have been reciting as an introduction to my lectures of discovering the treasures within now my dear brother Salman just mentioned how Jannah becomes wajib my young brothers please listen to me look at me Look at me, people. We are mentioning you. Yeah, look at me. My, my brother Salman mentioned how Jannat is wajib on people who make people cry for Hussein and people who cry for Hussein. Right? Now, it makes it so easy if you just have a connection with Abu Abdullah salam, to cry or even make a face to cry in this, in this gathering. It is easy for us to have Janma. But that doesn't mean that you have got a blank check and you go, once you go out from here, you can do whatever you want. That way you negate your Janma. Remember, in Islam, everything is fair and just. Just because you sit and cry doesn't make you or give you the authority or the power to do whatever you want once you go outside. Crying for Hussein makes you more responsible of your duties to do whatever Imam Hussain al-Islam represented. Mashallah. Right? Are you with me, all the young boys and girls? Mashallah. Yes. So when you cry for Hussain, what we are doing is we are softening our hearts. That is the main thing. We are softening our hearts so that we can do only good with soft hearts. Yes, sir. You know, hard-hearted people are the ones who do bad things, who do nasty stuff. Soft-hearted people always do good things. They might suffer in the process, but they always do good things. Now, another easy way to get salah or to get blessings is through salawat. Very simple. Everybody knows that. Even little babies who learn to speak, they know it thanks to the parents because they teach them. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And this is an easy way to gain blessings because we are all human beings and we are all sinners even without knowing we sin sometimes we say something harshly that is a sin so to negate all this easy way to gain goodness is salwa salwa ala muhammad wa ali muhammad person sitting on the pulpit says Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad make sure to say it don't just sit and relax your tired even if you're tired what it does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said people asked him how do we send blessings to you and your family and Rasulullah talked in this now a lot of people don't do the full salawat. This is they only do Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. We know that, but youngsters don't know that. Everybody recites a salawat, but some people recite it three fourths. You have to say salawat on the Al of Muhammad as well, till until then you don't get the blessings. So it is very important to know that you have to complete the salawat on the Prophet and his family. And this is how the Rasulullah taught us. So don't hesitate. And it is a sign of a mu'min who recites the full salawat. Somebody who doesn't do the full salawat, 
somebody who is constricted, who is, you know, when you choke somebody, you get constricted, he can't speak properly, he can't breathe properly. So don't be constricted, say it freely. It is a sign of a non-hypocrite. One who is a hypocrite will not recite the salawat. We don't want to be one of them when we are sitting in this majlis. Right? So sometimes we are just lazy. But we don't want to be lazy today, inshallah. Everybody is going to recite a loud salawat now. Salawat ala Muhammad wa So in the last few nights, uh, we have been discussing how to uncover our treasures from within ourselves by some good qualities that we have within ourselves and to bring them out to the fore. They are hidden sometimes, they are covered with dust of our environment, of our thoughts, of our bad actions. When we are naughty, you know, we don't behave properly, don't listen to parents, some, all those things, don't listen to teachers, don't do our homework properly, don't study when we are supposed to study. So all these things create dusts on our soul. And the goodness starts to get hidden. What we are reminding ourselves in these days and evenings is to bring them out. And to use the qualities that we already have to bring them out to the fore so that the bad ones are gone away. Just like a mirror. A mirror, if it's full of dust, you can't see your face properly. Right? If you, if you, you know, especially when in, in this country, when we have a shower, the mirror gets misted. You can't see your face. You need to remove the mist first so that you can see yourself clearly. And the more dry it is, the more clearly you see your face in there. So that is something similar to what happens to our soul when we don't pay attention to it. So we discussed truth, we discussed justice, we discussed loyalty, and we discussed how we'll all be tested. Today I'm going to touch a fairly vast subject which is hard to cover in one lecture, but I'll just skim through it. And that topic is of karama. I mentioned it in the, in the past few nights, one night I mentioned it, but karama is something what we translate in English as honor and dignity. Everyone has karama. Now, according to Shaheed Ayatollah Mutahari, I don't know if people have heard his name, he's a very, very big scholar, a very dynamic scholar, was, he's Shaheed now. According to Shaheed Ayatollah Mutahari, Everything in Islam is designed to increase your karama or bring out the karama. Everything in Islam. It is so good. Sometimes we don't understand all these things. Because, you know, don't get taken in by the media. Don't get taken in by the TV channels. Don't get taken in by your friends outside of this majalis in school or on the playground. Because this is difficult, that is difficult. It is, seems difficult because everything else around you seems to be easy. It might not necessarily be the correct thing, but because it seems easy, you do it, or you're driven towards doing it. And everything good which Islam is bringing seems to be harder. Oh, we've got to do wudu in cold weather for Salat. That is really hard. It's all in the mind. Okay, here we have warm water as well to do wudu. Oh, it's time to play now. I want to play you know, it's time for Salah, how am I going to go home and come back again and all that. It seems difficult because people have made it difficult. The environment around you has become so different that everything good for you seems to be hard. And that is the job of Shaitan, Iblis. He has chosen to sit on Salat al mustaqim and deviate people who try to follow Salat al mustaqim that is his job. He won't go into the pub to deviate people. He's already done his job. He's trying to get to you guys who are sitting here. And once you get out, they'll say, okay, now is my opportunity to get, get to them. But you're here, he's not happy. Why are they coming here and discussing these things? So remember, everyone can become a toy in the hands of Shaitan if we are not sure, careful. Sure. We don't want to be the toy of Shaitan. No. Because he has taken time from Allah to deviate people. But his job is, he doesn't do things. He just suggests in your mind. He just gives suggestions. What we call waswasa. He doesn't make things happen. You make things happen by listening to him. Or taking that suggestion. So you've got to be very careful not to take that suggestion. And that is what 
Our purpose is tazkiyah nafs, which I mentioned before in my lectures as well. Tazkiyah nafs, or purification of the soul. How do we purify it? Keep this nasty shaitan away from us. That's the way to do it. How do we do it? I mentioned the tools one by one. And today I'm mentioning karama. Now, one of Allah's names is Kareem. We always call Allah Kareem, right? Inshallah, yeah. yeah. Now I'll mention why we call Allah Kareem and how it works for us. Allah is Kareem. The Quran is Kareem. I just mentioned now. The words of the Quran are Kareem. Mm -hmm. The prophets are Kareem. All the representatives of Allah are Kareem. Why are they Kareem? We are very fortunate. Allah says in Surah Bani Israel, in uh, the Quran, that we have honored the sons of Adam. We have honored the sons of Adam and provided them transport on the land and given them sustenance of things which are pure and good. And then we have given special features to them over a great part of creation. So what that does mean? Allah has given human beings a special features, some special features which are better, which make us better and stronger than other creatures. You know, if you are in front of a lion, this is scary. But there are ways in which man has been able to capture lions and put them in zoos because of Allah has given us intellect. So. Allah has given us some special powers of thinking in which we can control anything at any time. And then we become better than angels. People who do that become better than angels. But people who don't do that and they succumb to every wish and every fancy that they have in their mind, they become worse than animals. It is all from the Quran. So it is very reassuring for us who are sitting here and all human beings that you know Allah has made us Kareem, He's given us Karama in ourselves. Otherwise imagine if there was no Karama, just imagine all the children who are sitting here. If you made a mistake, the teachers start punishing you, your parents start punishing you. But they don't punish you all the time. They are very fair and they are very calm, they give you a chance. If they didn't have Karama in their hearts, they, nobody would bother, they would be very harsh on people. And that is why Karama becomes very, very important. Now, another very, very important aspect of Karama. Uh, karama is huge, like I said. But some parts like Karama is like generosity is Karama. Being good is Karama. Soft-spoken person is a Kareem person. A part of Karama is doing good to orphans. Very important for all the older people who are sitting here. Mashallah. For orphans, it is important that we are Kareem on them. What is the definition? How do we become Kareem on orphans? Just putting a hand on the head of a yatim person is a, is a sort of a sign of Karam, but that is not enough. A yatim person needs to be taken care of. Remember, we all have, those who have parents are very, very fortunate. Even if you sometimes feel that, oh my God, my parents are so harsh on me. But you, they are harsh on you because they want to protect you. They want the best for you. Sometimes they might not have the best techniques, but they are still very loving and very protective. Ask the people who do not have parents, young children especially. There are hundreds and thousands of them, uncountable in this, this day and age, places like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, to name a few. And possibly in Pakistan as well, because what has happened in the last 10 years over there in that country, created a lot of orphans. It's just not enough to, you know, put your hand on it and say, oh, I'm so sorry for you, I have sympathy and all that. No, they don't need sympathy. What they need is to be given dignity. You need to give dignity to an orphan, you need to take care of him, do kifala. Kifala means what? Take care of all aspects of an orphan's needs. And that is what is important. Every people, every person here, we are very fortunate, especially the older ones. Take duty towards one orphan. Just one orphan and say, I'll take care of his needs till he or she becomes able. Till he or she is like 18 or 21 years of age or whatever, they've got a job. Everyone, if we take care of one orphan, the world will be a better place to live in for those people and for us as well. Now don't think that you're doing somebody a favor. What you're doing 
is you're doing yourself a favor. Because when you do something for an orphan, remember our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa He was an orphan. Yeah, he was an orphan. His father died before he was born and his mother died when he was three or four years old. And he was taken care of by his grandfather and his grandfather died soon after and then he was taken care of by his uncle who was his protector right up till adulthood. Not just adulthood like 20 or 25 years. He took care of him till he became 40, 41 years old. And that is how we take care of orphans. Allah gives these situations for us to learn from, for us to implement. It's not just a story that I'm sitting and telling you here and you like it, such a nice story, so sympathetic and all that stuff. No, we have to implement it. Tonight when you go home, think about it. All the older ones, mums and dads are sitting here. Take care of one child, one orphan anywhere in the world, in our country here or anywhere in the world. And if you do that, we have been able to do some of our duty. We have a lot of duty as human beings to another human being. We have done some of our duty. And that is why we need to think. It's all well and good. We have good food, good places to live, have a laugh, and come and cry for our Abdullah It's all well and good. But we need to show something for that. Real, tangible. We have done something in life. When Allah asks us, I gave you this and this, what did you do with this? Will I go and say I bought two cars from it? Will I go and say I went on expensive holidays every year? Okay, fine. Nobody's stopping you from going on holiday, buying a car. But think, can I put this to better use or not? Even if it means, you know, you sacrifice your nafs a little bit. That is my topic for the whole ashra. We need to sacrifice our nafs. And that is what we need to do. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I want to mention a serious hadith. Rasulullah that he said the one who takes care of orphans just look at me it's very important the one who takes care of orphans will be like this with me in Jannah Whoa. two fingers attached to each other Rasulullah raised his hand and said it like this the one who takes care of an orphan will be like this in Jannah with me Whoa, yeah. it is these things have been given as tools for us to perfect ourselves we are people who are sinners, but there are tools for us to help ourselves. Allah is not going to gain from us. Allah doesn't even, you know, need anything from us. Allah has given us tools so that we become better and better and better and better and keep getting better. You know, we, even we say about Rasulullah, who is the best of creations, even we say about him that Allah is raising his station each day, each moment he's raising his station. Every time we send blessings, why do we send blessings on Rasulullah and the Allah of Muhammad? Why? Because we say, oh Allah, send your blessings and salutations on the Prophet Muhammad and his family. Because Allah does that as well and the angels do that as well. So that means, what's the, what's the need for sending blessings on Rasulullah? That is because Allah is still increasing his station more and more. If Rasulullah's station is being increased still, can you imagine how much scope we have for our raising? Can you imagine? Where are we? We can't even compare ourselves to Rasulullah's physical life. Forget about his being the Noor and all. He was the greatest of human creations. We can't even be a speck on his character. Can you imagine how much we need to be raised? To come to a high station? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, I want to read some, I've got five or six sentences of a dua called Maqalimul Akhlaq. Mashallah. Everybody heard of it? Yeah? I have done a translation of it. Well, the translations are available on the internet now. If you haven't read it, or if you just read it in Arabic, go and read it in the language that you understand. It's a long dua, long, long dua. But I'm not saying read it all at one go, you can't. But try and read as much as you can. Two sentences, five sentences, ten, twenty, whatever, and think about it. 
I'm going to tell you how to think about it after I read these five sentences. Please bear with me and just pay attention. This is written by Imam Sajjad Allah Salaam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. Imam writes, think about it, Imam is writing. He's making a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's saying, Oh Allah, exalt me and affect me not with pride. Make me worship you and corrupt not my worship with self-admiration. Let good flow out of my hands upon people and efface it not by making them feel obliged. Give me the highest moral traits. Preserve me from vain glory. Raise me not a single degree before the people without lower me its like in myself. Bring about no outward exaltation for me without an inward abasement of myself in the same measure. This is Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. He was the best of creation alive at that time. Look at how he is being humble about himself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he is so humble, what about us? We have a long way to go, my brothers and sisters, to get to a certain level, to be acceptable, just to ourselves, to be acceptable to ourselves. Everybody here, not the youngsters, but the older people, everybody here has a lot of scope. Everybody knows they need to do better, to reach their own capabilities. Everybody has potential they believe they could have achieved, but they're not achieving it. Everybody knows that. Man, woman, anybody knows that they could achieve more. Why aren't we achieving it? Because we're not introspecting. I read these five sentences just to think, make us think what kind of a man this must have been to have been asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these things. You could ask anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His dua would not have been rubbed. But he was asking for improvement in character. He was already a very, 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 very good man. The best man possible at that time. And still he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him humble. When he does things for people, don't make them feel obliged that I've done something for them. Over here, we do something, we go and tell our friends, I did this, I did that. Or if you're very humble, then you go, you know, we will tell it in the form of a story. We won't say, I did it. But, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that it's known that I did something. We'll make sure of that. I'll tell you something now. When you do one good thing, all the boys and girls, listen to me please. When you do one good thing, you get ten rewards for it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is Kareem, remember. And if you go and tell it to somebody, that rewards becomes negative, becomes neutral. And if you go and tell somebody else, that becomes a minus. So showing off, not showing off in a very bad way, but showing off within your heart if you have the intention that you want to show off by telling people, making people know that I'm doing something good, that can negate all the goodness that we've done. Please remember this, all the people, boys and girls, aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters, when you do good, just let it remain good. Don't make, don't neutralize it and don't negate it. Every time we do good, just let it be. It should be like, if the right hand does something, the left hand doesn't know about it. It is not very hard, but we make it hard. Because our nafs wants to be known. Shaitan is playing games with us. He wants to be known that I did good. I'm so good. How good you are. How humble person you are. What a religious man you are. You made, you made a donation of a thousand pounds to the Husseiniyah. Well, nobody asked you for a thousand pounds. A one pound given with akhlas, sincerity, is much better than a grand given for the sake of showing off, of for feeling important within yourself. Even if you don't show off to the committee members, if you feel like, yeah, yeah, I'm a good person, I did something, that is negated it. In front of Allah, no need. For the Husseiniya, maybe they'll be able to develop a bit more. But as far as your accounting goes, that has been negated in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is my message for Karama today. I mean, we need to make a note of the dua that I just read five tenses, sentences, the translation of that. And if we read the dua,
Just make a note of all the things that Imam is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can read the whole thing. And tick whatever you have. I'm sure we'll have a few things. But many of the things we wouldn't have done, we wouldn't have been thought about that we could do this as well. We have this within us, but we could do that as well. And I'm sure whatever we have, we could do better. Inshallah, we'll all do better. On the first day, Azar of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, we think that, we intend that we do better with all our intentions. If the intentions are good, the results will be automatically good. But however, if you do something good because you feel that you should do it, but your intention is not there inside your heart, that, you know, will go away. Because, you know, there are two kinds of people. For example, somebody, a beggar comes, or somebody in need comes. He wants a fairly considerable amount of help. One person will empty his pockets, the other person will think about it. He knows it's a good thing to give, but he doesn't have to think about it, because it doesn't come naturally to that person. So he'll think about it and say, okay, if I give all of my 500 pounds that I've saved, I'll be left with nothing. Maybe I should give 10. The other person will give whatever he has at that time. So these things are a bit different. We need to reach a stage where it becomes our malaka to do and not ask. A Kareem person is somebody who's reached that stage where he's not affected by the evil of the other person. He doesn't want to react to that. And a Kareem person is one who does not expect good because he has done good. It works both ways, for evil as well as good. These are very important things. You know, in real life, this is what I'm talking about, ideal situations. A real life situation is if somebody does bad to me, I'll make it a point to remember that and get back to him one day. Maybe not everybody is like that. But if you get an opportunity, at the least people do is say, okay, if he's suffering, let him suffer. And you are capable of, you know, helping him out, and helping her out, but you don't do it. You know, I see some brothers smiling because they know what I'm talking about. Because we are, this is human tendency. Shaitan has overpowered us at many moments. And we need to be bigger than that. The followers of Abba Abdullah al Hussein need to be bigger than that. We need to be real good people, not just by words. If somebody has done evil, try and make dua for their hadaya. And do good for them when you get an opportunity. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the great examples of karam was Imam Hassan al Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, we know his stories. We know how lavish and how generous his table spread was. It was open for everyone to eat from at any time. No questions asked. Anybody asks for food, goes to Imam Hassan Dastarkhan and he gets the food. No money charged, nothing. You know, there was an interesting story once for the youngsters, it might be very interesting, just to take one minute. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the caliph of the Muslim Ummah at that time and somebody was there to pray and after that Imam asked him, would you like to have some food? And he said, of course, well, what better than have food with the caliph of a place? <coughs> now he's the leader of the place, he probably had the best food. So Imam said, would you like to have food at my place or would you like to go somewhere else? I can direct you where to go. She says, no, 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 I'll have food with you. He said, okay, then come on. So Imam Ali alayhi salam went home, took out his dry bread and he cracked it and dipped it in water to soften it and had it with salt. And this guy is absolutely gobsmacked. He's shocked that this is the leader of the Muslim Ummah wow. and he's eating dry bread. Why is he so poor? And he asked a question, so he's, because he couldn't break the bread, because it was hard, it was dry. And he said, why? You don't have money to eat? Or something? No, no, I have money to eat. I make this hard for myself, because I'm a bit different. I don't think you'll be able to manage this food. I'll tell you where to go. So he sent him to Imam Hassan's place. And that person had delicious food, alhamdulillah. Because Imam Hassan was not the one who used to eat a lot of delicious food. But he would give people delicious food. It's not important what you do. It's important what you do for others. Rich or poor doesn't matter. Whatever you have, whatever your capability is, do the best for the others. 
And when you do best for the others, when your intention is to do best for the others, the best will come out. But when you have bukhl, when your heart is constricted, it won't come out. Even though you know you want to do this, but in your heart, if your intention is not right, it will stay back. Somehow it will come out that the other person will know somehow that, you know, this guy is not very generous with me. So we need to be people who are generous with heart. Inshallah, Allah gives to generous people. Allah always gives to generous people. You might have hard times, but in the long run, you will get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the intention is right. Remember, intention is big on these things. Now, Imam Hassan was a Kareem person. He used to give half his wealth all the time in the, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Ummah betrayed him big time. Big time, the Ummah abused him. His prayer mat was snatched from under his feet once. Because people were not very faithful to Imam Hassan. Imam said something, you know, the people have become weak. They have become weak, they are controlled by shaitan and they don't want to support him. Even now, to this day and age, there are people who will say that Imam Hussein was conciliatory towards his enemies. He was friendly with his enemies. He made a truce with enemies. He wasn't as brave and aggressive and revolutionary as Imam Hussein al Islam was. That is totally wrong. <coughs> that is injustice against Imam Hassan al Islam. Imam Hassan was a very brave man because Imam Ali al Islam used to make him his commander in the battles of Sifim. He used to devise strategies on how to fight. So Imam Hassan wasn't a weak person, but it was his hikmah. Everything that an Imam does, is does with hikmah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam He knew it much before all this happened. He knew it, there will be people like this in our age as well. And Rasulullah said, Hassan and Hussein, are Imams of the Ummah, be they standing or sitting. Now that doesn't mean that the Imam was sitting on the Masnad or was he standing on his feet. Sitting would mean that if he's quiet and he's not raising his arms against an enemy, he's being, he's making a truce, he's making a treaty against his enemy. That is <coughs> sitting. Standing is a situation where you are revolutionary and you go and fight against falsehood. So Imam Hassan and Hussein epitomized both these aspects. So don't make it like Imam Hassan wasn't a warrior. Read the history. I'm talking about our own people here. Forget about the others. Let us get our facts right. And Imam Hassan was a warrior. He was a, he was a very good horseman. And he was a good warrior. And he was a strategist. And Imam Ali al Islam used to make him lead the army at times. So Imam Hassan has had a bit of injustice done to him. And the Prophet knew all this, and that's why he proclaimed this. Imam Hassan did a treaty with his enemy Muawiyah. Muawiyah was an enemy of Imam Ali al Islam, you all know that, right? Imam Hassan wanted to finish him off as well. But there were no people, there was no army that could support him. The army, Muawiyah was treacherous, very shrewd and cunning. He used money, bribery, positions, gifts, threats, rumors. Every kind of propaganda a politician uses against his enemy to deride Imam Hassan And Imam Hassan had to be careful, otherwise all the Shias would be killed. All the followers of Amir al-Mumineen would be dead because the army was going to be bought. There wouldn't be people to fight. And that is why Imam Hassan had to do a treaty. And there were seven points in the treaty, I don't have time to discuss it. So I won't say much, but remember, Imam Hassan did a treaty because he had the wisdom. If anybody read the history, any book, any book, doesn't matter who the writer is, of the Treaty of Hassan, he will notice that the adversary was a liar, a treacherous person, a hypocrite, not a Muslim, because he broke all seven points of the treaty. All seven points of the treaty. And he did the worst he could do, he poisoned the Imam. And the poison was from Rome. It was so strong that anybody who touched it could get affected. And Imam Hassan was poisoned so much that he vomited blood, he vomited his insides out. Can you imagine if a child vomits, if it's out of indigestion, he gets food poisoning. Parents are so concerned, they're so pained by that. Can you imagine your loved one 
vomiting blood, vomiting the intestines out. How hard is it? And that too, done by a family member. Astaghfirullah. Imam Hassan, when he was passing, he wrote on an amulet, a tabiz, and tied it around the hand of his little child who was there that time. And told his wife, Farwa, to open the tabiz only when you are in very desperate times. Very desperate times. And on the night of the 9th of Muharram, Imam Hussain is in Karbala with his caravan. They have been given one extra night to pray. Imam Hussain is telling all his members who is going to fall where, who is going to die when. He's telling everybody what is going to happen on the next morning, the 10th of Muharram. Qasim, the son of Imam Hassan is also there. He's a young boy, a teenager. Imam Hassan had many sons in Karbala, but we talk about Qasim because of his special nature. We talk about Qasim because he was young, he was delicate, he was a res his resemblance to Imam Hassan was striking. And that's why we talk about Qasim tonight. Qasim was listening to his uncle talk about all these things, and he asked his uncle, Oh, Uncle Hussein, what about me? Am I going to be amongst the martyrs or not? This is a young child. He's just into his teens. He's asking, am I going to be among the martyrs, uncle, or not? Imam Hussein doesn't reply to him directly. He says, my dear nephew, what does death mean to you? And this is no ordinary young boy. He says, oh, uncle, Death in your way, for the sake of Allah, is sweeter than honey. Is sweeter than honey. Can you imagine the thought process? Can you imagine the heart of this young child? But he asks his uncle again, Oh uncle, will I be amongst the martyrs tomorrow? And Imam Hussein al-Islam again doesn't give a direct answer. He says, even Ali Asghar will be among the martyrs. And Qasim is very concerned and worried. He says, Uncle, will the enemy forces get into our tents? Imam Hussain replies, No. I will bring Ali, As Ali Asghar out of the tent. And I'll take him with me and he'll be martyred. What Imam did not tell Qasim was that after we are all dead, there will be no tents. They will be burned to the ground. That was the tragedy of the day of Karbala on the 10th of Muharram. Qasim, on the 10th of Muharram, wants to go out to battle. He asks permission from Imam Hussein. Oh, uncle, give me permission. I also want to go and fight in the battle. Imam Hussein says, Oh, my nephew, you are the sign of my brother. I cannot give you permission to battle now. He asks many times, and many times Imam replies in the negative. Qasim is saddened. He is crying by his mother. Oh mother, my uncle does not give me permission to fight for him. <coughs> Farwa thinks about what to do. Then she remembers the advice that her husband Imam Hassan had told her about. She remembers that there is an amulet on Qasim's arm which Imam Hassan had told her about to take out only on a very desperate time. And Farwa realized this is the most desperate time on the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she asked Qasim to open the tabis. There are two messages: one for Qasim and one for Imam Hussein. Qasim reads his message. It says from his father, "My son, do not be shy. Do not be shy on the day of Ashura to sacrifice yourself for your uncle. That's the day of great need for your uncle." Qasim takes the next message for his uncle to Imam Hussein and he gives him to read. Imam Hussein opens it and he sees the writing of his brother, his Imam, in that message. It is said, Oh brother, on the day of Ashura, let my son be my representative for you. Give him permission to go out and fight for your sake and sacrifice himself. Imam Hussein is in tears. He sees the writing. It is an order from his Imam as well, his older brother. He looks at Qasim. They both hug each other and they cry. 
the narrators of history tell us that uncle and nephew cried so much that they fell unconscious onto the ground. When Imam Hussein gained consciousness, he got Qasim ready, Abbas got Qasim ready for battle. There was no armor for his side, he was a young child. Oh, yeah. Armor was loose on him, the helmet was loose on him. Imam Hussein ripped open the mama and tied around his head and let it dangle around the collar of Qasim as a sign of an orphan. And then he put the helmet on so that the helmet would fit and not fall off. Abbas put him on the horse, but the legs won't reach the stirrups of the horse. He was so young, he was so small for his size. He tied the stirrups, shortened the stirrups for Qasim and put him on the horse. He looked back at his mother. Faraba was watching from the gate of the tent. She saw her son go out to fight the enemy. Umar ibn Sa'd said to Azaf al-Shami, who was a champion warrior, go and kill this boy. Azaf said, it is beneath me to fight a young boy and kill him. He sends one of his sons to fight Qasim. Qasim kills that son of Azaf. He sends his second, his third and his fourth son. Qasim in one-to-one -one combat is very strong. He's been trained, trained by Abbas. He fights them and sends them to Jahannam. Azaf is enraged. He goes, by Allah, I will kill this boy. He goes and fights Qasim. Qasim is no slouch on the sword. He fights Azaf and he kills Azaf as well. There's another man who says, by Allah, I'm going to kill him. And Muslim al Hamid, who's an historian, who's a narrator of the events in Karbala, says, why do you want to kill this boy? His face is so shiny, it's like as if it is shinier than a full moon. <coughs> and that man says, I'm going to kill this boy to hurt his uncle Hussein. Oh, yeah. People yeah. are so nasty. Oh, yeah. They were going to kill a boy to make sure that his uncle was hurt. He goes out. Qasim's strap of his shoe had broken off, so he bent down to tie it. The enemy sees the moment of vulnerability. They attack him from all around. And this man takes an iron rod and smashes into Qasim's body. Qasim's spine, they say, has been broken by that smash, by that iron rod. He falls off from the house and he cries out to Imam Hussein, Oh Madrikni! Oh Madrikni! He falls down and because of the commotion caused by all the screams, the horses from the left go to the right and the right go to the left. And they keep going from the right to the left and they trample Qasim's young body. They trample his ribs, they break his ribs, they shatter his arm, they shatter his legs. Imam Hussein is like a raging lion. He's trying to get to Qasim. Qasim is screaming, Amma Adrikni, oh uncle help me. Help me! He cries out again and again till his voice goes quiet. <coughs> Imam Hussein reaches his nephew. Oh, yeah. He says, Oh Qasim, this is so difficult for me. This is so difficult for me. I cannot, I could not reach in time towards you. I could not reach you when you were crying for help. And now that I have reached you, my help is no good to you. How would have an uncle felt? He takes one of broken arms of Qasim and wraps it around one side under his abar. And he takes another shattered arm of Qasim and wraps around him on the other side of the abar. And he tries to pick him up. His legs are broken. Everything is shattered in Qasim's body. He is limp. When he went out to battle, he was so small. His legs couldn't reach the stirrups of the horse. Now, after the battle, when he's been killed, his legs are dangling on the sands of Karbala while Imam Hussein is taking him to the tent. He calls out to Rabab, oh, Rabab, come and visit your son. Qasim was the only person in the battle of Karbala who was trampled by horses when he was alive. He was the only person who cried for help more than once. He cried and cried for help for Imam Hussein because Imam Hussein couldn't reach him on time. He was the only person, can you imagine? He was the only person who was trampled by the horses when he was alive. Rabab comes out and raises her hands up to the sky. Oh Allah, please accept this as my sacrifice. 
فهل أنتم لا لقوم الزالمين فسيعلم الذي 